Yes, sir. Um, the first item, um, Boston Street, was postponed, and that item has been placed. It was put. It was sent out in an email for. Uh, but this item has been postponed. And this is uh, Cross Street. This is Cross Street, 14 to 12 to 14 East Cross Street. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, enter your appearance, please. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Joe Woolman on behalf of the licensees. Good morning, Judge Ward, members of the board. My name is Patrick Nichol, and I'm here on behalf of the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association. All right, would you spell your name again, please? First name, Pat. Mm -hmm. Last name, McNichol. after Patrick? Yes, sir. Patrick. Last name, McNichol, MCN. That's what confused me. N as in Nancy. I C H O L. Okay. All right. Now, uh, who wants to go first? Well, Your Honor, I have a preliminary matter that perhaps the, uh, the, the board should consider uh, initially. And, and just by way of introduction, I have the licensees as well as our neighborhood consultant staying to my right. I don't think. Are they all going to testify? Not necessarily, Your Honor. I just wanted to introduce them. They're here as, as well. Uh, they got to see if that's more comfortable for them. Okay. Uh, I'll try to call them during the preliminary argument. Uh, as, your, as Your Honor is well aware, we filed a motion to dismiss this matter. And it's interesting because you have two issues before you today. You have this quote-unquote remand. I think it's actually a stipulation of dismissal. I would characterize it more than a remand. That's the one issue you have before you. You also have the hardship request, which we were here before you a few weeks ago and consolidated the two matters today. And I think it's interesting because the subject matter and the background regarding the motion to dismiss also have a lot to do with the hardship because certainly these licensees have endured a long history of hardship in this matter. Uh, by way of background, uh, this license was originally purchased from a small corner bar named Turner's on Cross Street in 2009. Uh, the license was initially uh, meant to be moved to a location on Charles Street and due to various issues and difficulties, the licensees weren't able to complete the deal with the property owner on Cross Street and hence they've now acquired additional properties, I'm sorry, on Charles Street, that, that portion of the deal didn't go through. They then acquired additional properties on Cross Street and that's the project that has been ongoing for a number of years now uh, and, and is the subject property uh, that is before you today. There's been numerous protests, uh, numerous renewals of the license every year, and I think that's, that's key if we get that far. You know, it has nothing to do with it, but uh, that Charles Street property, that wasn't the old Stonewall Club, was it? No. <laughs> no. Well, it's not. No. Okay, go ahead. It's, a, it's an old uh, dilapidated service station, at least out of the last year, from what I can tell by just looking at it, and it's, it's actually owned by another, another client. Um, however, uh, back, to, back to my point, uh, there's been a long history. There's been a lot of hardship faced. I know we're not at the hardship phase at the hearing, but I think it's important by way of background. There was even a protest in 2011 uh, by this same group regarding one of the renewals. Um, uh, that's just another example. Of, of the hardship uh, that's been faced. There's been a renewal of this license every year since 2009, and I'll later introduce that as to the record again if it's necessary. The validity issue, which I believe is the limited scope of the subject matter before the board today, was first raised in 2013. There was a motion made by the same group, different council at the time, but by the same group to uh, ask the board to rule on validity. Um, and the board denied that motion and denied the transfer at that time uh, for an earlier version and, and, and iteration of this project if you will, that it contained a much larger capacity, it was a larger place, and my clients lost at that point. Despite having, having failed uh, to, to have the transfer completed then, and despite the fact that protestants prevailed in their case in chief, a, a, an appeal was taken to the circuit court in 2013 on the board's denial of the validity issue. And this is where we really get to the crux of my <coughs> motion for dismissal. Back in uh, 2013, this first appeal, I'll call it the first appeal, uh, was taken. And counsel for the board at that time, still the counsel now, and myself both appeared in front of a circuit court judge and argued a motion at that time, at which time the court reviewed the record in the 2013 hearing, and the court, not a stipulation of dismissal, but a judge sitting and hearing from all parties, again, there's a different counsel for the neighborhood at that time, but a court had a hearing, heard from both sides, and determined 
that the matter should be remanded back to this board for hearing and the creation of a record on the validity issue. That hearing was held on February 20th of this year. It was, I believe, three hours plus. There were some, I want to say, 26, 27 pieces of evidence received and marked and introduced and accepted by the board. There was a substantial record created at that time on the issue. I think the court also said it should be heard in 30 days. Yeah, it had to be heard within 30 days, which basically at that time meant the month of February. We heard it at the very end of February, just making that deadline, Your Honor. And again, a very substantial record was created at the request of the judge. There was no stipulation between the parties at that point. It was a judge that heard the matter in circuit court, and the judge remanded the matter to this board at which time the record was created. February 20th, we have that long hearing. The board makes its decision based on that substantial record to find the license. The protestants file a second appeal to circuit court, and this is where it really gets interesting, Your Honor. Despite the Maryland rules to the contrary, the board, and it was a different staff then, I apologize, the board never notified the licensees of this appeal being taken. The licensees learned from other sources that an appeal. He points out in his response that you have a letter 10 days later in which you acknowledge that acknowledgement. Yes, as I was about to say, Your Honor, you're correct. We found out through other sources that an appeal had been taken. We didn't receive a copy of anything, and going forward, we never received a copy of any pleadings of any kind. Most importantly, and really, that- At that point, you knew. We knew. We knew an appeal. What's the point? The point is this. The point is, at that point, we were preparing to insert ourselves into the appeal. Whatever it is, you knew. We knew. We knew at that point. We wanted to insert ourselves into the appeal, obviously, because the licensees spent a significant amount of money and resources to obtain this license and develop this project. So clearly, we had an interest. We were a little concerned that we weren't being brought into the conversation as a party to the hearing below by the board's counsel. And the reason I bring all this up is, until I met with your new secretary, executive secretary, we were preparing to go to circuit court, Your Honor. We were preparing to go and argue that the record created on February 20, 2013 was sufficient, and under the law, which provides great deference to administrative agencies, as you know, we feel the court should have upheld the decision reached on February 20th. Again, unbeknownst to me, and this is really the upsetting part, Your Honor, and I mentioned it a few weeks ago, and I think you raised your eyebrows at that time. Counsel for the board met with or discussed with counsel for the protestants a stipulation of dismissal without notifying us of any of this. Here are my clients who have been trying to develop this project since 2009, spent six figures on this liquor license because it's in the restricted Federal Hill area and had a lot of value because of that, and we're preparing to go to circuit court because you're right, we knew there was an appeal, and we're preparing. I came in to meet with the secretary of the board and review the files and prepare for circuit court. At that time, I was told, well, have you talked to the counsel for the board yet? And I said I had not recently, and I was advised to talk to counsel for the board and tried to reach counsel for the board and couldn't. I then, I think a day or two later, I think maybe it was the next day, received at the courtesy of your current secretary, and I wish she was here back in February, I received a courtesy copy of this stipulation of dismissal that was an absolute shock to us. Here we are preparing to go to circuit court and try our case in circuit court where it should be and where I would argue today it still should be, and we get word after the fact yet again that there's been a stipulation of dismissal between the parties. Well, certainly we were a party back on February 20th, 2013. I was here. I argued vigorously for hours. You didn't take it up with the circuit court. You never filed a complaint. As to not being represented, it was silence. Didn't file a complaint. Again, we were prepared, and why wouldn't we at this point, Your Honor? Are you asking me to change the ruling of the circuit court? No, I'm asking you to dismiss this matter before you because under the law and under, frankly, Your Honor, your own administrative decision, number one, that you've issued to the protestants in this matter, a record was created before this board on the same facts and the same issue, and a determination was made. Under the case law, I cited in my memorandum, I'm glad to pull it out and reference again, the board does not have the authority on its own initiative to rehear this matter unless there's new facts 
on the record, and they're and they're not. The court didn't dismiss it. They they sent it back for reevaluation. Based, based on a based on a stipulation of dismissal, which I would argue under the law under they the case. Said what? They said why? Actually, they, all they all they did in the docket entries was enter the stipulation of dismissal. The parties said why. Yeah. A judge never heard this, Your Honor. Unlike back in the first appeal, <coughs> where a judge reviewed the record, determined there wasn't a sufficient record, and said, you know what? I'm I I the court. I'm going to send this back to the board to create a record. When I finally did reach counsel for the board, I said, why are we why are we doing this again? Why are we going back before the board? Did we just have a three hour hearing in February? And, and her statement to me was to create a record. We already have a record. And the, more importantly, the court above did not review that record. It merely entered a stipulation of dismissal between the parties, which did not include my clients or me, and the matter is back before you. The court above not having heard anything about the sufficiency of the record that was created on February 20th, which I would argue is more than sufficient, and the matter should remain in circuit court, Your Honor. Multiple points to that, Your Honor. First, here is a copy of the order signed by circuit court judge Pamela White remanding the case back to you. Second, as my opposing counsel notes, the licensees did have notice of the appeal, and now they're claiming that they were ready to go to the circuit court, yet they never did file an appearance before that tribunal. Even more with regard to the opposing counsel's argument that somehow this claim is precluded by res judicata, they cite, I believe, five cases, all of which are, all of which precede the two cases we cite, which hold that an agency of the state of Maryland may review errors of law. We are not asking you to relitigate the facts. This is strictly a legal argument in which we believe that estoppel cannot be held against a government agency. No, sorry, I thought you had a question. Previous makeup of this board declared the license at issue valid under a theory of estoppel, even though, as that board confirmed, the license was expired under Article 2B. In the state of Maryland. I think there's no issue right now before he argues his case, is the issue of the coming back the second time. Correct, and under Article 2B, Section 16-101, subsection E4II, the circuit court may remand decisions back to the liquor board. Even more under Maryland Rule 8-604D, it also holds that in the interest of justice, a case may be remanded. I agree, and I think it is back again, and I can't read the judge's mind because I wasn't there, but this is a circuit court which has jurisdiction, of course, over the liquor board. So we're going to go on now with the hearing. Go ahead, sir. Very well, Your Honor. I believe it's a petition on remand, and I'll defer to opposing counsel to present their case, and I'll respond accordingly. As I referenced before, a previous makeup of this board declared the license at issue valid under a theory of estoppel, even though, as the board had concluded, the license was expired under Article 2B, which governs the validity of the license. Under Maryland law, the government cannot be estopped under the same terms as other litigants. I think the whole issue of estoppel, though, is simply a payment of the fees. I mean, that was – I couldn't understand, really, what the liquor board chairman was saying. It was very confusing, but that seems to be the basic reason. Isn't that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. The license had expired, and after the license expired, employees of the liquor board exceeded their authority in accepting renewal payments for the license. However, that is not authorized under Article 2B. In fact, in 2001, Senator George Vela attempted to submit to the legislature a law that would provide authority for the liquor board to do so under various circumstances. However, that did not pass in the legislature of Maryland. It is obviously not the law that the renewal fees could have been accepted, and therefore that does not stop the liquor board from declaring the license invalid as it would under Article 2B otherwise. Did you know that Senator Vela is here today somewhere? Yes, sir, and he is prepared to speak regarding the statute, if you would like to hear. Is he a witness for you or for the other – He's a witness for us, yes, sir. Do you have any other witnesses? No. Okay. Go ahead, sir. So it is our position that under Article 2B, the license has expired and the government cannot be stopped. The Court of Appeals has held that on countless occasions. Two recent cases are Marzullo v. Kahn, in which an individual received approval from the zoning board to construct a reptile barn on his property. I believe they approved that under 
zoning RC4, which was only for preserving watersheds. And with that, you were allowed as a matter of right to, to construct a, a single family property. Obviously, a reptile is not within the purview of that statute. Eventually, they revoked the statute saying that it was illegal. And the individual appealed that and claimed that, he was, that the government was a stop from denying the validity of the license. The Court of Appeals held that the individual was charged with knowledge of what the zoning board could do and therefore uh, revoked that license. They said he could not rely on the legal acts of the government agency. In another case, ARA Health Services versus the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services, the state erroneously had paid medical costs to a to the department to the uh, health services company for the payment of AIDS medication for um, inmates. Under the law, they were only allowed the money for hospitalized inmates and not those that weren't hospitalized. Uh, therefore, in a future credit to the health services company, they withheld the money previously paid. The health services company said that we already relied on that money that you have provided us, therefore you are stopped from enforcing the law as written by the legislature. And the Court of Appeals again said that you are charged with knowledge of what the government agency is allowed to do, therefore you can't rely on their unauthorized acts. And that's precisely what we have here. The licensees kept paying their renewal payments even though the license was expired. They're now claiming that they relied on the acts of the, the liquor board in allowing those payments and that the liquor board is now stopped from enforcing the law as written. Under Maryland law, that, that is not acceptable and therefore we ask you to reverse the liquor board's previous decision and declare the license here invalid. All right, now, um, first, before I go ask you for you to present your witnesses, I want to see if anybody has any questions. Mm -hmm. In one or two of the cases that you cited, yes, sir. where government employees provided services that cost the money, yes, sir. when they put a stop to that, were they given the money back that they lost and providing the service? In the case of you cited? No, sir. They were, the money was withheld from a future credit, and that's when the, the, the services company sued the government when that money was withheld from a future um, reimbursement. The government provided the service? The government provided reimbursement to ARA Health Services who provided uh, medical treatment to uh, inmates with, with AIDS. And then the medical group that provides the service to the inmates to the government for money. Correct, the government had overpaid the health services company, the private company. They had they, they overpaid. The government either made the health care company reimburse them or either they held future money from going to them. The, the, the money that was spent would, be, would either come from money that they don't receive or either the money that reimbursed back to the government. Is that correct? I want to make sure I'm clear. The government got their money back either by getting it back from the company or by not giving them future funds and deducting that money from the future funds. From deducting the money from future reimbursements. Right, but they were made whole. The government was made whole, yes, sir. Right, thank you. Questions? Mm -hmm. No questions. All right. Call your witness. <clears throat> Swear the witness. I raise right hand. Please swear or affirm the testimony that you're having given this hearing to the truth of the truth of the And your name? George Dallas, D.C. LFA, 405 East Hamburg Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 212. And for the benefit of others, you were a state senator? For 28 years, served in the Maryland Federal Senate. All right, we're glad to hear from you. 46th District? 46, well, starting at 47th District and 46th District. Um, Why don't you use the microphone next to Certainly. Pardon me. Um, let me. Let me narrow my comments to this one issue. I was the sponsor of the 180 day rule. I made it law. And it was done so for, for two reasons. Number one, the licensees that I represented in the district, they wanted it. Number two, the community groups. 
they wanted it because it absolutely made sense because of the number of liquor licenses that were in existence at the time. That was in 2000 that was passed and became law. You say the, uh, because of the number, of, explain that again. Because, because of the great number of liquor licenses that existed in the city. And how would this uh, rule affect that? Well, because, I think, I think the whole issue became, or, or came to the surface because the activities of a liquor license broker who was selling licenses and trying to transfer into the neighborhoods where there was always where there was already a great number of liquor licenses uh, community groups opposed it and he would in fact uh, shell those not shell them but you know try to peddle those licenses in the neighborhoods where they weren't wanted they came from other areas of the city you talking about licenses that were not in it not in business or were not in business not in business. And because of that, a couple of things happened. We built a wall around the district. Can't transfer anything into the 46 legislature because of that. Then came along 180 day rule. And that is existing law in Baltimore County and was at the time, and that's exactly what this mirrors Baltimore County law. And it's really quite clear. The bolt, the the, admin, the administration at the time, James Schroeder and my former colleague Senator Nathan Irving, they complained to me that it was causing them to lose license revenue. And would I please consider uh, changing the law to allow the board to? continue receiving that revenue because licenses were being filled. Well, because of my, my relationship with both of them, I said, all right, you send me the wording you want, I'll drop it into the legislature, which I did in 2001. Well, the feathers hit the so what was you gonna tell us what the, uh, what the wording was or it's not yes. important? First of all, here's, here's a copy of Senate Bill 128, it is current law, um, dealing with 180 Any extras? I've got one extra, and I don't want to exclude anyone. I'll t give mine to Payne. That's then, then in 2001, at Jane and Nathan's request, I introduced Senate Bill 138. And the meat of it would be, and here's a copy of that. And I'm sorry I don't have enough copies to give it out. Council, anytime you want to see it, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Here's, here's the wording that I think the applicant is looking for, for relief. Notwithstanding any other provision of this section, if all license fees have been paid to date, the board may grant an extension to the period the license is being unexpired for a time that the board determines to be appropriate due to bankruptcy, fire, natural disaster, displacement, by condemnation, or other unusual circumstances, which would have opened the door to the 180-day rule. Well, the feathers hit the fan because the licensees that I would worked with putting in place the 180 day rule, they were upset. The neighborhood groups were upset and came to me and said, what are you doing? You're undoing current law. Well, it was all because of the friendship that I had with Senator Irby and James Berger. And I, and I went back to them and I said, look folks, I understand you're having a revenue problem. But it's not going to be helped by this because I'm withdrawing the bill. I sent a letter to the committee asking them to withdraw the bill from their files and records and the bill was given an unfavorable report. So what 
I'm saying is... So let's go back, then that left the existing... The existing law. Now tell us what that bill is. That's your bill, you said. Correct. And it passed. Correct. And that was in 2000. Correct. And what does it say? That basically says the license can remain dormant for 180 days. And then if there's a hardship, then that licensee can come back to the board and make their case that they're in a hardship situation and the board could then grant them another extension of 180 days. That's the ones on the books now? Correct. That's current law. Now, That's what limitations are there for extensions? Any? None. And can it be re-extended? No. And what happens to the license if it's not, if the person does not take advantage of the 180 day rule, or does take advantage of the 180 day rule, what's the effect on the license? If they take advantage of it and the time is told 180 days, or prior to the end of the 180 days, and they come before this board and plead their case, the board may or may not grant them another 180 day extension. Beyond that, if they don't activate that license, that license is dead. That's what the legislative intent is behind the 180 day rule. And the board knew it. The board knew it. After this, after I withdrew this Senate Bill 138 in 2001, which would have relaxed the 180 day rule, I then went back and worked with both Nathan Irby, Senator Irby, and James Schroeder in helping them in addressing what they said their problem was, and that's increasing license fees. Because they claimed they didn't want to kill the licenses because they didn't want to lose the revenue. But that doesn't, you know, but the 180 day rule is a 180 day rule. I mean, it's actually a year if you come in and make your case to the board. In other words, you say at the end of 180 days, one day before, during that period that the license is dormant, they can apply for a 180 day hardship rule. Correct. And if the board grants it. If the board grants it. Then that would give them a full year. Correct. At the end of that year, if the license is still dormant, what then? That license is dead. Anything else? Any clear questions? I don't have any questions, Your Honor. I just want to state for the record regarding the last statement by the witness that although a former member of the legislature is certainly entitled to testify for legislative intent, but it's Your Honor's job to interpret the law as a matter of terms of what happens to the license after it's dormant. So I would just make that objection for the record. All right. Any further questions of your witness? Commissioner, questions? I do have a question. Was there, in terms of the legislative intent, was, as this was being discussed, was there any discussion as to what constitutes hardship? No. So all an applicant or a licensee need do is come in and say, we're experiencing some hardship undefined. Correct. And they get that additional 180 days. We don't have our act together. You know, we're, you know, we're struggling here. We're, you know, making improvements to this facility that's going to become a licensed liquor establishment. Okay. And we're not talking about transfers now, but it's rare that we get this living legislative history and on the intent. And so I want to... I could give you more. I could give you the whole about Article 2D. I mean, it's one of the most boring, you know, articles in the annotated code. I would have agreed with you prior to June 24 when I joined this board. But I can give you, I can give you a 28-year history of it. I don't think we have time for a 28-year history, but in terms of transfers, we've been applying the 180-day hardship rule to transfers of licenses. Is that appropriate or is that consistent with the legislative intent or no? You have applied... The 180-day rule to transfers of licenses. So not just extending the life of a license, but when a licensee is attempting to transfer a license from one location 
to another. It's taken, in some instances, um, two years, three years. Uh, but a 80 day rule should apply. Okay. All right. Any questions of the witness? No, no other questions of the commission? Right. You noticed you kept brought up a huge thing in with you. you was that of some kind of exhibit or, or you just carry it around for fun? <laughs> Josh, can I show it to you? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm afraid. I'm, I mean, it's not exactly <laughs> on point, but I, you know, it'll give you sort of a, a, a picture of why I was doing what I was doing and why I know sort of okay. all the nuances of Article 2B. Break our suspense, shall I do? You'll have to excuse me because, and pardon the public, but this, this is a map of what I used to represent, the 46th legislative district. And out of the, I think it was 1,390 liquor licenses at the time, you know, we had almost half of them. Half of liquor licenses in Baltimore City. And over that period of time, Mr. Wallman, you know, described a wall being built, uh, built in the wall around, uh, the establishments on Cross Street, First Precinct, 23rd Ward. Did the same thing <coughs> over in Canton, uh, that's the 5th and 6th Precinct of the 26th Ward. And I used to go around the neighborhood groups and show them what we were dealing with because the number of liquor licenses and the size of <coughs> the establishments affects the quality of life in neighborhoods. And much of the legislation that we passed, you know, we based on uh, dialogue between community groups and myself for 28 years. And whether it was the 300 foot rule from, from churches or schools, which I didn't dream of, Senator Burr welcome, dreamt that up with her district, whatever that may have been numbered at the time. Uh, yeah, we adopted that, my colleagues adopted it citywide. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't all anti-licensee. He introduced the first uh, pub brewery license legislation for, you know, the system. Good businessman on Cross Street, great establishment, neighborhood office, um, you know, it's just, but, but it's things like that. Six day licensee, they complained because it could be open on Super Bowl Sunday or, uh, you know, put a provision in the law where they come in in five days, you know, to stay open those, I think it's up to four days a year or something like that, with the fee is. But this is, this is what we were dealing with. And that's why you have the 180 day rule in place. That's why, you know, I mean, I try to be fair minded and open with everybody licensees, community groups, and you know, and you might ask, why would licensees want, want the 180 day rule? Well, because you can only cut the pie up so many different ways. That's why they came to the table and fall into it. And like I say, I wasn't the genius who dreamt that up. It mirrors what they adhere to in the law in Baltimore County. That's where it came from. And what was the effect of uh this 180-day rule with respect to density of licenses. Was there any uh, effect from it or result from it? Correct, there were, because the board initially uh, killed licenses. I mean, they were deemed dead. If, in fact, they had been dormant for the, the one-year period of time. I know that because I knew some of the licensees, and they were yelling, screaming, kicking, hollering. You know, why did you do that? The wall. So, so the <clears throat> you go back. If a if a person took advantage of the 180 day rule on the last day of 180 days, they would get another 180 days. Correct. But at that time, if the license is still dormant, the license would expire. Is that correct or not? Again, I I would I, 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 for the record is the legal legal conclusion from the witness Your Honor. I believe what that's absolutely correct. I, I believe what the board was doing that at, at that point in time 
was being lax in the application of the uh, timing of the first hardship request and, uh, and allowing people to come in, make their hardship case after the 180 day period, but it wouldn't it wouldn't toll from the time of that request. It would toll from the time of the uh, of the initial 180 days. If you follow what I'm saying? No, I, I don't. I, I, I explain it again. Okay. If if 180 days had expired and someone had not made a, a hardship request prior to the 180 days, the board would allow them to make a request after, but it would continue to toll from the initial beginning of 180 days. Anything else? Questions? So what you're saying is, if I'm following you, um, if a licensee does not apply for the hardship extension within that 180 days, on 181, on the 181st day, that it's too late. The license is dead. Technically, that's Technically. You're right. You're right. And yeah. certainly, if it's 365 days later, a, a whole year later, which has happened, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's this case. It's good and dead. Right. Um, one of the arguments that we hear often is. Um, because large amounts of money have been spent in advancement of opening an establishment with a license that technically has expired, the board should take that into consideration. In other words, so much money has been spent, there's been large expenditures, um, sure, the time period has elapsed, disregard that and extend the license. Was that ever considered as a factor in the legislative process of bringing about the 180-day rule? Yeah, when people are spending a ton of money on improving a place to open sometime in the future, I would imagine that they've hired some big, big shot lawyer to protect their interest, and they ought to be aware of the, what the law is. So it's sort of assumption of the risk? It is. I mean, I get out of jack and legal conclusions. Well, wait a second. He's not making legal con conclusions. He's answering my questions. And I feel very fortunate to have this information because it's, it's something we deal with all the time. And I'm new to the board. And I would. I, I come yeah. back at any time and sit with you in a non hearing situation and give you a legislator's perspective on how things are done, or how they should be done. And, and As lawyers, we always want to know why something was done. We always want to know what something problem... Something you might not want to know. Well, <laughs> I, I just want to know what problem was trying to be solved by this rule. And so therefore, what you're telling us today, this morning, is very, very, very helpful. There's um, a fine, you know, in all of what I said, I mean, there's a fine balance uh, between the number of licensees and 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 in the interest of neighborhoods, because you want people to move in to the city, and which they've done, you want them to have nice restaurants, nice taverns within walking distance. Because my God, when you get home, if you live in one of these neighborhoods in Canton or in Federal Hill, you park your car if you can find a parking space, and you're locked in. And most of these young people have got cookless kitchens, so where are they every night? <laughs> They're out finding a half-priced burger or a you know, cheap pizza. And, and it's, all, it's not just the young people, it's the older <laughs> folks who, uh, who take lunch or take dinner uh, at uh, I, I the Charles Village Pub. Uh, so, so the other question I have, you said that you sort of did a circle around Federal Hill and, and closed first, it off. First, first precinct, 23rd Ward. And the purpose was what? Uh, to prevent the transfer or the creation of any new licenses into the precinct. So, uh, I was wondering, uh, just, just... And, and, and did the same thing over the camp. Okay. So, my, 
as I was thinking about this case and other cases in Federal Hill, if this license is found to have expired, um, what are the options for the licensee? Buy another license from an existing location. They can't. And, 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 and honest to goodness, I cannot remember the number of licensees in that precinct. That has sort of been lost in the back of my head. In your chart, you had a lot of stars, and my right. granddaughter would love that chart because she loves all those, those stickers. But did the different colors mean anything? The different types of licenses. Okay. Or licenses. Okay. You know, whether they're seven day licenses, six day licenses, package big stores. Okay. I think that's it for me. Thank you. Any other questions? I was going to run up about four miles an hour. Any questions? No questions. I'd just like to be heard in rebuttal. Any other questions? They are. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. And then before you today, talks about mistake. Where was a mistake ever made here? Where did we ever argue a mistake? We argued there was a tolling of the 180 day rule, which is in the existing law, which was in the existing law that, that the former senator testified to. We've argued, for whatever reason, protestants mentioned their memorandum. It was the first time that we've raised that issue. I'd like to quote from the, I understand Your Honor denied my motion to dismiss, but I would like to quote from the February 20th hearing, page 28 of the transcript, which is myself speaking at that time. The license has been renewed every year. It is very interesting if you look at FHMA's chart that each time the license is renewed, there's nothing listed in their chart regarding that in the third column. The reason for this is obviously they do not want to admit that the license renewal can certainly be construed as a tolling of the period under Article 2B. So I made it then. <coughs> page 31. Let, let me uh, <coughs> interrupt you at this point and tell you that just from my reading that <coughs> you were not taking advantage of the request for the 180 day rule and you didn't use it and uh, the issues of granting extensions by the liquor board had nothing to do with the 180 day rule and the tolling kept mounting up and mounting up until finally he gets a hundred over a thousand and some days and you have not taken advantage of the rule at all and the reason we didn't take advantage of that rule your honor is there is a rule within the law and i'm going to quote from the high court of this state from so last admit, year. You admit that you never did that. Never, we never filed for 180 day hardship, but what we did do was renew the license every year, Your Honor. And with all due respect to the former I senator, and the reason for my objections to his legal conclusions is the high court last year ruled on this issue, and there's a case that is directly on point regarding the renewal of the license every year well, tolling the period. Stop a minute, and let me just make sure we understand your point. Certainly. Okay. You did not use the 180 day rule, but you're relying on the fact that the fees were paid. Was that what you're relying on? No, we're relying on the fact that we renewed the license every year and that under the law from the, the high court, through the liquor board, mm -hmm. and under the you're law. You're referring to these occasional uh, decisions by the liquor board. No, I'm talking about the, the consistent multi year routine renewal by this board acceptance of fees by this board of my clients renewal for this license one of which was protested in 2011 and protest failed so i just want to repeat it mm -hmm. you're, you're not relying on the request to extend the license through the 180 day rule not the 180 day. but you're relying upon the payment of fees and the fact that this board acted renewing your license from time to time and most importantly your honor the fact that the 180 day rule has within it a provision that the 180 day rule is told if a transfer application is then pending. I argued back on February 20th. I argue again today under the case law that I cited that the board is given great deference in its interpretation of its statute. The board can certainly that's when consider. Uh, you know, that's when, when there is a conflict or it's reasonably, uh, I mean, I. I I'll be honest with you, I didn't think that applied here at all. Very well, but what does apply, Your Honor, is the ruling from the High Court. Would you agree? What is when, when I'm ready to cite the... Would you? Have to cite it. Okay. okay. I don't want to interrupt your <coughs> argument, but you have to understand that, that if we commissioners don't understand what you're saying, you know, it, it's better Perfect. to Perfect. ask the question. Understood, understood Try to understand what your position is. And I appreciate that, Your Honor. Thank you. <coughs> Just to finish my earlier point, I again argued tolling on page 31 of the transcript. And you have plenty of time, so three left. <laughs> That's fine. I just wanted to make the point that this was argued before, back on February 20th. I, I argue it again here now. What was not 
brought up on February 20th, and I do bring up now, again, with all deference to the former senator, the reason for my objections to the legal conclusion, I think was a very good question that the commissioner asked, what happens after that total of 360 days expires and the license is dormant, what happens to the license? Well, the senator testified that it, that it dies, that it's dead. And I respectfully disagree, and the Court of Appeals of Maryland, as of last year, respectfully disagrees. It's a case that's actually, you have, you have a copy because you cited it in your, in your, in your memorandum. It's Yim, uh, Yim, Yim LLC et al, V M Hazlip to zero. Correct, you're correct. It's Court of Specialists, second highest court in the state, and not overturned, by the way, after Shepard in the case, Your Honor. Um, the conclusion reached by the court in that case, and it's, this is directly on point to this situation. There was a bar, a controversial bar. This is a restaurant, but a controversial bar in Charles Village named Two Sisters. And that license was deemed expired uh, by the court. Not unlike this situation, I'll read directly from, uh, from the decision. The total time period for which the licensee could be deemed unexpired was thus 360 days from the cessation of alcoholic beverage businesses or from April 30th, 2008, is the date <coughs> cited for the unexpired period of the license to have occurred, April 2008. If 360 days had run, the license could no longer be deemed unexpired. The court went on to state, however, I'm sorry, you have a question? Well, I was thinking you were going to give us the, the site. You said Yim LLC at all. 211 Maryland App 1. 63 Atlantic 2nd, 1078, 2013. Okay, and it's M versus? Versus M Haslip, H-A-S-I-P, I guess it's Haslip, 2-0, T-U-Z-E-E-R, et al. The court went on to state, after, after finding that the 360 days, which the senator was talking about, had, had ran, the period for which the license could be deemed unexpired was 360 days, thus April 30th, 2008. The court went <coughs> on to rule. Two sisters also filed an application for renewal of the liquor license in October of 2008. Now this is where the facts differ. They didn't file a renewal until after the cessation of the unexpired period. My clients have been filing renewals consistently on a yearly basis since 2009. So I just want to make that distinction. Nevertheless, the court Two sisters filed an application for renewal of the liquor license in October 2008. Although the exact date is unclear, the application was notarized October 21st, 2008. The board received it on or around October 31st, 2008. And by the way, the court does reference section 10-504D, which is the law that the senator was testifying to. Section 10-301J permits the board to charge a fee of up to $1,500 or even reject a late application, but does not preclude the board from accepting applications more than 30 days after the March 31st deadline. Accordingly, the board was within its, within its rights to accept Two Sisters' October 2008 renewal application. And here's the, here's the clincher. Two Sisters' liquor license thus survived beyond Two Sisters' business itself and lived on to be renewed or transferred. These are years of licenses, and I'll submit this as my exhibit number one. Years of licenses from this board granted to my clients. I don't know if I'm a big shot lawyer like the senator said, but I would argue that I'm here to protect their rights because they followed the direction of the liquor board. They received a license each year. It was a renewal. The renewal tolls the 180 day period and the Court of Special Appeals confirms that directly on point. Is there one? <laughs> and with that, I submit this one. Your Honor, uh, opposing counsel did not cite that case. Wait a minute, just one minute. Any questions before we go on? I do have some questions about the case, but perhaps you will, uh, I'll ask after your presentation. He did not cite it. He's merely citing a proposition that the license survived after the cessation of the business. Under Rule 10-504D, it, it does survive 180 days, potentially 360 if a hardship extension is granted. I did not have the opportunity to review this authority as he did not cite it and is essentially blindsiding us with it this morning, but I assume that's what the, the court is holding because the color of the law states that there's 180 days to, uh, the license survives 180 days after the business closes or 360 of the hardship extension is granted. And the, the liquor board under its authority cannot uh, accept renewal payments past that for an expired license. 
essentially it's an estoppel argument he's making. Question. If indeed the liquor license is renewed, does that toll anything? Not under the rule. Under Rule 10-504D, there are three situations in which the license can, in which the, it can be told, and that is, it's transferred, but a transfer must be completed within 180 days under Rule 10-503D4, whether there's a hardship extension granted, or whether the licensee passed away, in which it can be told in that event as well. And other than the transfer here, none of those situations apply. Hardship to the person who has that license. No one never informed them, not this case, but in the case, that this license isn't any good. Because, cost, because they're taking your money. They're taking your money. So that's an indication to me as a client, a liquor license person, that you're saying to me that my license is good. So help me to understand why, sitting over here, I would make a decision that would adversely affect that person standing over there. Yes, sir, and that's the premise behind the Court of Appeals not allowing a stop against the government. While you may be doing that individual a favor by upholding the actions that the Liquor Board takes, you are also doing a disservice to the rest of the general public in not upholding the law as the legislator, their representatives, wrote. Questions? Any? Yes, I wanted to go back to the Two Sisters case, and I think I've got some familiarity with this. Is this the, the location was on Howard Street. And that's not as important as my next question. Or series of questions. While you ask that question, I'll try to get an answer to your first question. So my next question is, I wanted to get the timeline on the license in the Yim case. Because I do agree that the holding of that case is that a license can survive the cessation of business. That's not our issue here. That is not our issue here. I understand. All right, so that's a clear distinction in the facts. What will be important to me is to know whether or not the Court of Special Appeals specifically found that the license continued on and was essentially revived after its death by the acceptance of a fee. And I completely agree with you, and the Court absolutely answers your question. And let's hear what they say. I'll read it word for word. The total time period for which the license could be deemed unexpired was thus 360 days from the cessation of alcoholic beverage business, or, in this case, I'm adding that, from April 30th, 2008. So I will now make comments. What the Court is saying, I'm just going to make sure everyone's clear on this sentence. The total time period for which the license could be deemed unexpired. In other words, the total time that they had under the 180-day rule was 360 days. And that's what they're saying. They had that, and that ran on April 30th, 2008. So while I would argue it's not dead, I would argue it's dormant, which is what the Chairman, the word the Chairman used in the last hearing. This is what the Court is saying. It's deemed unexpired up until that point, so therefore it's deemed expired, if you will, to take the actual language used by the Court. In the next paragraph, the Court found two sisters also filed an application for renewal of the liquor license in October of 2008. So the Court has found, per your question, the license, to use your term, was dead in April of 2008. The Court also found that a renewal application was filed in October of 2008. Although the exact date is unclear, the application was notarized October 21st, 2008. The Board received it in around October 31st, 2008. And Section 10301 permits the Board to charge a fee of up to $1,500 or you can reject the late application. It does not preclude the Board from accepting applications more than 30 days after the March 31st deadline. According to the Board, it was within its rights to accept two sisters' October 2008 renewal application. And then the final sentence, two sisters' liquor license, and I think this answers your question, two sisters' liquor license thus survived beyond two sisters' business itself and lived on after the April 2008 date, lived on to be renewed or transferred. Again, if I may? 
April 2008 to October 2008 is six months, 180 days, which is permitted under the statute, but which a business is not operating. This does not change the law as written. <laughs> this case is within the purview of what Article 2B permits, and I apologize, I have not read the case, case recently, but judging from the expert that, that opposing counsel cites, that's exactly what the case holds. Question, yeah. Jane Bug? I guess it's unclear because if, if the two sisters' license was effective until April 30, 2008, and they could apply for hardship beyond that, that gets you to six months and then to six more. They could. The court found that the 360 days had already ran. There was no more hardship available, but what's available is a renewal. And what's interesting, and counsel actually makes my point for me, what's interesting in this case is the renewal was, was accepted after the death of the license and prior to any other renewals. In this case, my client's been renewing this license since 2009. The renewal was accepted after the business closed, not after the death of the license. That's not what the court said. I think that's, that's, that's what I'm struggling with. Um, that's the point I'm struggling with. Because the license may survive post-business. And we know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not debated and Certainly. it's not the issue here. Then, then why are we here, most respectfully? I mean, if the license, if you're, if you're agreeing, I think, if you're I think we're here because um, a prior board made decisions that are not wholly consistent with the law. That's what I think. Well, I know I, you think something different. I certainly you do, and I think, think that's what that's the sense I'm getting. And you know, I, you know, I'm new, so I, I don't know. I think that this is I appreciate that. I do my own timeline, and it's just, it's just really um, concerning the actions that were taken, as well as the inactivity. I, 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 would, I would argue that there was activity, and that was the well, that was the constant renewal of the license, and I would and I would well, respond to your question about that. It, it just it's just a little it's just not. It's, it's, I, I understand I understand your question. I would again I would again refer to the language of the court, which I think is fairly clear. I, I recognize that you that you're unclear at this juncture, but the, the language is fairly clear that the 360 days, which we've all and, and the senator argued, that's the maximum amount of time that you can take advantage of this hardship extension. It's 360 days. So the court found that that had already ran. And then that ran in April. And then in October... Uh, Do you know what a cert was applied for in that case? Was cert denied? doesn't indicate that cert was applied, but I, I don't want to answer that absolutely without doing some more research. But I, I did research whether or not the case had negative treatment. It was overturned. Um, and again, I think, I think it's... Has it been cited? I, I, believe it was, I believe it may have been cited, although I, I, I don't... Again, I don't want to say something that's not correct. Um, it was not overturned, it was not overruled once, once I realized that, and it was just last year um, that the court made this decision. But I think, I think this decision, taken in conjunction with the statute itself, which, which calls for the tolling of the 180-day period, and then perhaps most importantly, the, the case law that allows the, the board to, to interpret a statute combined with this decision from the Court of Special Appeals, in my, you know, in my respectful opinion, leaves the board no choice but to find these licenses, including the current one, which is on top of that file, which is good through April of next year, is, is, are valid licenses. And, and the, uh, the licensees who have invested significant time and money, as, as the senator points out, uh, have certainly uh, relied on those licenses. Why wouldn't they? This whole estoppel, I understand that previous chairman picked up on estoppel, and I, and I agree with, with you, Your Honor, it's somewhat confusing as to his decision regarding estoppel, but it really isn't even an issue here. I mean, estoppel involves a mistake, and all of the cases cited by counsel involve mistakes by staff, etc. There was no mistake here. A license was renewed every year. So, so that's what gets me. I do think there was a mistake. I really do think there was a combination of mistake, um, judgment misapplied, um, benefit given. The case, that, the Yim case doesn't go to the crux of the issue here, and the crux of the issue here is whether or not, as I'm hearing the argument, whether or not mistake, error, I, I 
probably shouldn't go so far to say wrongdoing by an administrative agency can be disregarded once it's been learned of. And the, the Yim case doesn't go to that. Because the Yim case points out that this isn't a mistake. The Yim case points out that renewals are but accepted. But I, I wonder, it, I mean, I, it's not clear to me, and I, I wish I'd read the, uh, the case before we got here. The court special appeals isn't going to go into territory that it's not asked to go into. And my question is whether or not the Court of Special Appeals was even given that issue, whether that issue was presented to the Court of Special Appeals to decide. But what? But it is before us now. It is a question that we're being asked to decide, and um, that's what makes this complicated. It's Again, respectfully, the only only mistakes that have been allegedly made have been, have been alleged by the protestants. We did not make that argument and try to argue estoppel in that fashion. And with regard to the case, I think it's moot as to whether or not that issue was presented because the ruling is very clear on the on the 360 days but, but having expired and then the license renewal being accepted. I, I, I'm, obviously, we're going to agree to disagree. But, we can but, agree uh, to disagree. But I get, and we do I, agree to I, disagree. I'm missing where, where the language isn't clear in the case that that after the unexpired period runs up for 360 days, the board can accept a license renewal application. Therefore, it's not a mistake. The Court of Special Appeals says it's not a mistake. And that can <coughs> provide the the death, if you will, I, I don't like to use that word, but the, the, to use your word, the death of the license. Well, it's not my word. Well, I thought you said you thought it died. So that's what well, but I would say died because that's what everybody in this room says when they talk about right. the life of a license. I have zombie so license. I, he, well, you know, I think I got a B in civil procedure, and I and I don't. And you did better I, than I, me. I don't so. think I even took an appellate procedure course, um, but I do understand appellate law to the extent that I know that a court won't consider a question of law that it's not been asked to consider, and. Um, unless we can get information that shows that they were asked that specific question, I think the question remains open and undecided, and we need to now make that decision. Just, just, just to answer your question on page three of, of the opinion, the neighbor's position was the license was dead. There's that word again. The, the neighbor's position was that the license was dead and not subject to a transfer because it automatically expired 180 days after two sisters ceased doing business at the property on May 30th, 2008. And we know that's not true because you can they could have applied for a hardship extension. But that was the neighbor that you're right, I'm not I'm not agreeing with the neighbor's position oh, okay. in the case either. But that was the, I believe that should help answer your and question as to the issue before the court. You know, and I do do some homework. This is why I say I mean this is I mean this is all I mean it's not my original thinking to call a license dead. I I, 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 would, I would just make one other I statement. Accept the language of others. Understood. I would just make one other statement. It seems to be a term that we all understand. I, I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, just just so I'm clear. Oh. If I may, I just one final statement with regard to this entire theory and, and, and I believe law is applied to this situation. If, if this board were to rule that given these facts, this license could not have been renewed all these years and my clients could not be moving forward with the development of several consolidated dilapidated lots in the city, then it would be ruling that any developer anywhere in the city that in development, I represent several developers in commercial years, um, and I would argue that it perhaps maybe or should be the board's policy that it's better to transfer an old license that is purchased rather than trying to go get new licenses because I think overall in the city the, the goal is to reduce the number of licenses and I certainly understand that goal. If you rule this license invalid, that would mean a developer like my client who's assembling properties and dealing with all the other real world issues regarding real estate development could not purchase a license from another location, renew it to preserve it after the, th as they, could, they could use the 180 day rule as your honor pointed out, but this goes beyond that. You can preserve it during, and I would argue that a lot of development takes more than a year, most of it does actually. You can preserve that license. As a matter of fact, on the license itself, you can read it, it says contract purchaser. And that's often what's listed in development forms and applications. If you don't allow this license to be preserved in that fashion, how can redevelopment in parts of the city where 
I've got a client who's doing a large mixed use project not far from here who wants to put a restaurant with a liquor license in it and they're shopping right now for a liquor license. This project probably won't be finished for another four years. And they can preserve that license by removing well, it this year. That's an interesting point, but um, uh, you're asking, of course, what would the liquor board do in view of uh, extension beyond the, beyond the one year period? <coughs> and uh, perhaps an estoppel situation might arise under that. Uh, but I understand what you're saying. Thank you. I am ready for decision. I have one more point on the your honor. I just want to point out that the opposing counsel's argument at the end here is essentially something to be taken up with the legislature. The liquor board is a quasi-judicial body that derives its power from the legislature and cannot go beyond what the legislature gives them the power to do, which is included under Article 2B. Further, if we uphold the opposing counsel's suggestion that the license be deemed valid because renewal fees were accepted, we're essentially allowing members of the liquor board to rewrite the law and whenever a license is dead, they can simply renew that license, therefore, therefore reviving it. That was not the intention of the legislature, and we ask that you reverse the previous decision. Well, I think Thank the you. law is clear that the legis what the legislature says the legislature means, and I'm always interested when I see court opinions uh, beginning to go way beyond what it says and trying to read other meanings into it, and including a, a court of appeals, special appeals decision, which has nothing to do with this case on the definition of what a citizen is. I'll never forget that one. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let me go on. On the 23rd of July, 2009, the board approved an application and transfer of a license to 1218 East Cross Street. No hardship exception was ever requested. No transfer was ever completed. Article 2B, Section 504D, Baltimore City license expires, is the word that and it's not dead, but expires 180 days after the holder of that license has closed the business or has ceased active alcoholic beverage business operations unless hardships requested pending or approved. With respect to transfer, Article 2B, Section 10-503D, a transfer must be completed within 180 days. Of course, I'm quoting the legislature. If not complete within the time period, then the authorization lapses. The Attorney General's opinion that the 108-day statutory provisions is mandatory. It's clearly stated many times. June, uh, I can't read the date, something 19, 2009, application to transfer ownership of the bar turners to the new, uh, this licensee, applicants, uh, also the transfer or request for location change from or East Cross Street to South Charles Street. The board on July 23rd, 09, approved. The application and the transfer, 180 days, starts to click. 180 days goes to January 19, 2010. Then Mr. Sam Daniels, who is a, a, a member of our staff here at that time, put in some kind of a hearing or a meeting, granted a extension until July 25th, 2010 for transfer to be complete. Nothing happened until September 16th, 2010. The board gave another 60 days to November 15th, 2010, and nothing happened. This is on your transcript that I read, 20, page 21. Protest in April 2011, not successful. Another renewal again transfer on uh, page 21 nothing happened on August 18th 2011 the board granted another 60 days that makes it 276 days and nothing happened it wasn't told according to what I was uh, reading the new 60 days goes to October 17th 2011 the staff writes a letter on February 28th 2012 you haven't paid, you, right? They write a letter to the licensee. The license is going to expire. You better pay. They paid, and then the renewal is given. That's on transcript page 21. On May 2nd, 2012, the staff writes another letter. Didn't pay the license fee. Said the transfer was approved, supposed to be completed. You stated this process on July 2009. On transfer 22, 
It says the original location for the transfer was 1100 South Charles Street. The, L, the original LLC that was going to operate this restaurant for, was forfeited in its charter for failure to file some kind of uh, property release. And this was on October 1st, 2012. It's one of those strange situations that's never explained later on in the record. The board granted another 60 days extension. Now we're at 395 days. No action. New date is January 14th, 2013. On February 2013, an application for transfer and expansion. The hearing was July, June 27, 2013, and the board denied the transfer. It was an appeal to the circuit court on validity issue. Board counsel said the board had not had a full discussion on the matter as a final <coughs> hearing and remanded to, and said that you have to have uh, a result this month. And then here we are, says the board, on February 20th, 2014. The license, the licensee had had the license for 1,673 days and for three years with no tolling, or 1,146 days of no tolling. Um, <clears throat> now comes the issue of estoppel. Uh, estoppel is argued at this point, and we're, it really is, I think we all agree, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, I don't know what they're talking about. On transcript page 35, says the, the board says they're renewing the license absent protest. And uh, my question is how? The license is valid, and then they raise the issue of race judicata, and then the board says that doesn't make it doesn't i say it doesn't make sense the board decision of the hearing on february 20th 2014 they were pondering a stop said the board does the acceptance of renewal fees preclude us said the board from declaring this license invalid as of today meaning february 20th 2014. did the licensees detrimental detrimentally rely on perhaps promises we made, said the board, by accepting the renewal fees. And quoting directly, to avoid injustice to the license is to declare the license viable as of today. And that was what the board's decision was. So basically, in order to avoid injustice, the board decides to renew the license. Thus, the board decided to balance the equities it determined existed without any factual findings in total lack of regard to its binding laws. <coughs> then there is a legal memorandum filed by Mr. Woolman of race judicata, collateral estoppel on his page five, Court of Appeals, where substantial evidence is the court accords deference to the uh, administrative agency in its sphere. And I find that there's really uh, no conflict of facts or anything that would, uh, would that this would apply here. Following the stipulation of dismissal and agreement for remand from the, court, from the Circuit Court of Baltimore City, the license lease finally filed a request for a hardship extension. This board stayed the motion until the issue of the validity of the license is resolved. On September 4th, 2014, I ruled that the issues, both the validity of the license and the hardship extension should be consolidated and heard today. And here we are. In Miller versus State, 174, 362, now 1938 case is quoted, Article 2B, Section 1, 101B, 3, quoted saying, quote, the powers granted, and I'm directly quoting, but leaving out certain words, the powers granted may not be construed to grant powers not otherwise granted, end of quote. So the code says it expires in 100 days after closure or ceased activity. The transfer must be completed in 180 days. <coughs> Again, the word shall means mandatory in Maryland express directory direction given by the legislature regarding the privileges, not right, of dispensing alcohol. The citizens are charged with knowledge of the law and certainly the lawyers. Here in this case, 
there is nothing ambiguous of the facts. The clear command of the law is ignored. And on page 12, uh, the action by the administrative agency, the liquor board, outside the scope of its authority, may not form the basis for equitable estoppel. <clears throat> Article 2B, the 180-day rule, within which a party must complete a transfer is told only upon death, is pending, or it is filed within the 180-day period. Thus, acceptance of renewal uh, <clears throat> does not toll the 180-day time period. The legislature in 2001, which was quoted in argument, considered giving the liquor board the power to grant extensions of license fees for the, if are paid was not passed. That was uh, Senate Bill 138-2001. A government body cannot be stopped from enforcing the law by unauthorized actions of government employees. And again, the case of 366 Maryland 158 of 2001 was quoted. The licensee argues they weren't notified of the appeal. And I mentioned the council uh, points out that 10 days after the decision was docketed in the circuit court, a letter dated April 9, 2014, counsel for the licensees wrote <coughs> Oberman, the chairman of the liquor board at that time, and acknowledged that the Federal Hill Neighborhood Association had filed an appeal in the circuit court. This matter is now before this board on the remand from the circuit court of Baltimore City for further consideration. Prior illegal, incorrect, inexplicable decisions place a duty upon an administrative agency to correct. Section D of Rule 8604 allows a remand for further proceedings in the interest of justice, nor should the liquor board try to correct mistakes, omissions, failures to act of the licensees by examining what is best for the licensee. The sale of liquor is a privilege, not a right. <clears throat> the license has expired for all the reasons stated above. <clears throat> My fellow commissioners, your positions. I agree with uh, Chairman Ward, uh, and really for all of the reasons stated, and I can't state them um, any better or any more clearly. <clears throat> I have a, a few questions going this year and trying to get some clarity on the subject matter. And it's easy for us to sit here today and say, well, the last four, we can't justify our decisions by the last four. Uh, we as a body are charged with reviewing the law, listening to the information coming before us, and then we making a, us making a sound decision. And that decision may differ from the last board. And sometimes presentation before the new board is slightly different from the presentation of the last board. My decision. I think that this case is one that is bigger than this body here. I think this case is one that should be before the circuit court, although it was demanded back to us. Um, I don't agree that we as an agency did all the things we needed to do to convey to the licensee that you are responsible for whatever they were responsible for. We didn't make that clear to them. Yes, they do have a right to know the law that governs the business that they operate. Yes, if they don't, they should have some legal authority that they can go to to get this information. But in real life, it doesn't happen that way. And I know we have laws to govern how we live and interact. And I always say, we need to deal with the intent of the law. And sometimes the intent is somewhat, sometimes lost when you read the law. And we all have comprehension. We, we all can interpret things, but we don't always interpret the same thing. We have two learned lawyers before us, and neither can agree. We have three judges here. Two of the judges say no. I say yes, I'm that the license is dead. And I'm saying no. I think a second chance is needed. And just to clarify the no's, uh, we both voted uh, no, and you're voting uh, yes. Yes. Gentlemen, you have our decision. Thank you, Ron. Chairman Ward, I'm sorry. Uh, 
I, 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 I wouldn't be myself if I didn't respond to that. I just want to say, I, th I do think that um, licensees are um, charged with understanding the law of, of liquor licenses, and they all have the opportunity to retain counsel if they wish. It's not required. In this case, the licensees have able counsel. They have a very, very good attorney. Um, the, the size of the filings alone would attest to that. And I think that they've been well represented by counsel, um, irrespective of anything that the board did or didn't do, the previous board. They have an attorney who could advise them every step of the way. And I have to believe um, that uh, the licensee's attorney informed them of the challenges that this case presents. Um, I clearly agree with Judge Ward, Chairman Ward, on this, um, and I don't want to go back over all of that, but it just, th this is not a case of uh, confusion or uh, lack of very, very good legal counsel on the, on, for the licensee. This is, th there's no mystery here. Folks, we'll stay in recess at 1.30. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.